Aus Belahmin Shaitwan Rajim Bismillah Irrahman Rahim Assalamu Alaikum. This is Aftab Ahmed with Flashpoint, the program that looks at issues, dilemmas, and stories which concern the Muslim community in the UK and Europe. We have many pressures as a community placed upon us to be uh, within our humanity, if I can say it that way, because the whole point of living together in a melting pot of different cultures, religions and different ways of life is that everybody gets on together in such a way that the whole melting pot works as a system. There are, however, some parts of the system which I can't say fail but which never want to be inclusive the right wing, the very far right, the very far right wing is one of those examples. We've had National Front, which became the BNP, and other mutations in between. We now have the EDL, the English Defence League, which in itself is raising its ugly spectre all over the UK. They are planning a march in Manchester next week and to discuss the issues arising from this and the, if I can say, their uh, way of viewing the Asian, especially the Muslim community in the UK. Well, I have today with me two very, I can say, active members within our community. First of all, on my right, we have councillor Daniel Gillard. He is a councillor in Manchester City and is the intergenerational uh, member, lead member for intergenerational issues. My tongue is not following my brain at the moment, so bear with me. And next to him, we have Paul Jenkins, who is the Northwest Regional Organiser for Unite Against Fascism. Good evening to both of you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, can I begin by saying thank you for and welcome to the program. And uh, obviously in my intro I said that the far right wing is I uh, say a group of people who never want to join in the rest of the community. They all want to be set apart or to set us apart. Am I right in saying that to begin with? Do you think that the right wing is opposed to uh, a universal community? Yes, absolutely, Aftab. Um, when we talk about groups like English Defence League, like British National Party, and we should say EDL and BMP have very strong connections, let's not forget leading BMP members have said things such as multiculturalism isn't working, um, they've said they want an all-white society and BMP and EDL are very opposed to not only multiculturalism but the Muslim community and black and white and Asian people living harmoniously together. Okay. So you're absolutely right about that, yeah. How do you feel about that? Indeed, um, I can only agree in the strongest possible terms with Paul. Um, I'm privileged and lucky enough to serve my community in Withington in South Manchester and um, I describe Withington as a community that is multicultural and that is very happy that it is multicultural and I think that what groups like the English Defence League, the EDL, um, seek to do, um, they come forward with a message that says multiculturalism isn't working or multiculturalism is dead. It's alive and well. They want it to die um, in order that they can then step into the vacuum that would be created. What do you think the English Defence League uh, well, let's put it this way. Is the English Def Defence League part of the BNP or is it a separate organisation altogether? Let's begin with that. Sure, sure. First of all, I think it's important to say that the English Defence League EDL first appeared on the scene when BNP were about to make their big first breakthrough into mainstream politics in Britain when they won their two seats in the, mem in the European Parliament in England, one of them here in the North West. Yeah. That was when the EDL first appeared on the scene. Their leadership and membership is made up of either ex or actually current BMP members 
uh, the, the leadership is made up of ex-BMP organisers. Indeed, the, the leader, uh, Tommy Robinson, real name Stephen Yaxley Lennon, was a BMP organiser in Bedfordshire. And if we take a, just one example, in Stoke and Trent, when the EDL had what they called a protest, it was actually a violent racist riot in Stoke and Trent, BMP Stoke and Trent councillors were present uh, within the EDL's violent protests. And very recently, while BMP leader Nick Griffin had previously, at least in public, tried to pretend that there was no connection, Griffin last year actually lifted the ban on members of his party, the BMP being EDL members, and they, are now wor they have now worked much closer together in recent demonstrations than previously. Daniel, before I bring you in, I want to ask uh, Paul one very uh, important question. What is the objectives, aims and ob objectives of the EDL? Yeah, the aims and objectives of the EDL is they are opposed to the Muslim community. They, they want an all-white Britain. They are opposed to all black and Asian people. They want what, in, in my view, and I think it's correct, they want to get rid of all black, Asian and Muslim people from Britain. And not only that, they are actually, uh, recently the EDL have been widening their targets and attacking trade unionists, political opponents, independent bookshops, uh, May Day workers' demonstrations and so on. And I think the EDL are not only a racist organisation, but a fascist organisation. The, but their main focus is on Muslims. Their main focus is definitely on, on Muslims, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in some of the activities they've carried out. For example, an EDL member was recently convicted of trying to blow up a mosque in Stoke and Trent. So they are anti-Muslim, yeah. Daniel, is the Manchester City Council aware of this? Mm -hmm. And if they are, how are they reacting to this? Mm. Uh, Manchester City Council is very much aware of uh, the presence of the EDL and their plan. Uh, excuse me, <coughs> of the presence of the EDL and their plans to uh, come to Manchester on the second of March. And thankfully, to that end, um, seventeen of my fellow councillors and myself uh, have signed a statement supporting Unite Against Fascism. Um, so I would say politically, the council is very much aware of it and are uh, doing their best. Uh, I would hope and and say to. Um, formulate a response <coughs> that, that says clearly um, that we don't want the EDL in Manchester. So on that level I would say the council is politically very well aware of the nastiness and, and of the potential for trouble with the EDL and the police are equally aware of this as well and um, I, I think most people within the council would rather they uh, took the message and took it somewhere very far away from Manchester. Um, Message of hate and mm -hmm. it is indeed, and yes. it is a message of hate. And uh, Paul's point about them being a fascist organisation uh, can be proven through their tactics. Fascists have a long history, uh, both in Britain and in Europe and the wider world, of seeking to uh, isolate and persecute uh, successful integrated groups like Muslim uh, communities, Muslim families, Muslim businessmen, and individuals. The aim of the EDL uh, for now is to attack Muslims in the main and trade unionists where they can and others, uh, in order to. To create a group uh, around which right-wing thinkers can organise and target and increase their popularity by doing so. So um, that's something we, we really must be aware of. They're yeah. picking on Muslims in the way that people picked on other minority groups in Europe, in, for instance, yes. in the 1930s with the Jewish communities in, in Germany who suffered unspeakable horrors. And uh, I think if the EDL, if left to their own devices, and if not opposed, would do exactly the same to the Muslim community. Absolutely. And you can see some of the banners mm the EDL have had on their demonstrations say no more mosques. This is mm. what these people want. Mm. Yeah. I think uh, the, um, that particular issue about firebombing mosques yeah. Yeah. and firebombing community centres where mm. Muslims gather, that has brought home to Muslims mm. the fact that they need to be having a presence on the streets themselves as well, mm -hmm. a peaceful yeah. presence but to let people know that they exist, that they are here, absolutely. and that they can stand up for themselves. Would that be the...? Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the leading EDL members said that he wants Muslims hiding behind their curtains. He wants Muslim people to be scared, to be intimidated, and to hide away. We can't have this. Therefore, that's why it's important that whenever the EDL come and hold a racist protest in a town or city, 
that the vast majority of the community, the Muslim community and others, come out onto the streets in numbers to peacefully protest against the EDL and not be intimidated and to say that we are proud of being Muslim, we are proud of being part of a multicultural Which community. Which we, we are. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And we're, we're going to stand up to these people. We're not going to be intimidated. So, so that is important. Because you're the uh, Northwest organizer for Unite Against Fascism, yeah. I presume you are the person or one of the people who uh, is involved in marches, not just for the Northwest, but nationwide. Yeah. And the other marches that they've had, the EDL, English Defence League, mm. the marches that they've had, can you give me some examples of the type of things they do? I mean, the violence or the uh, uproar they create or the damage they create? Certainly. Um, in the run-up to a number of EDL protests, and I'm thinking now of places such as Preston uh, or places in the northeast of England, the EDL have attacked mosques, they have daubed graffiti on mosques, they stuck a pig's head on a mosque uh, in the northeast, they put bacon on the railings of a, a mosque uh, in Preston. And if I take two examples of EDL demos, Luton and Stoke and Trent. Luton in 2009, yeah. which was the EDL's first demonstration, they went on the rampage, they attacked Asian people in the streets, they attacked Asian owned businesses, they overturned cars. In Stoke and Trent, these people did exactly the same. And you can add to that as well that, uh, you know, on the periphery of these demonstrations, uh, the EDL have tried to attack individual Muslims. And indeed in Manchester in 2009, just before the EDL came and held their protests here, what did they do? They attacked Muslim graves and uh, yes, smashed yes, Muslim yes, graves yes. Uh, in, in Manchester. That's what these people want to do. Now what, it's interesting I, I use the examples of Luton and Stoke and Trent, yes. because in those places there was either no demonstration or a very small demonstration against the EDL, yes. and therefore because there was no opposition really, mm -hmm. they were able to go on the rampage. Yeah. Whereas if you look at places like Walthamstow or Tower Hamlets recently, the EDL have not been able to move because people have come out in their numbers and opposed them in Tower Hamlets. There were so many people came out onto the streets, mainly from the local community, but elsewhere as well, but mainly from the local community. There were so many people that the EDL could not even step foot into the borough of Tower Hamlets. That's what works, coming out who peacefully were protesting. Who, who were the people on the protest? Yes. There were a, a lot of people from the Muslim community. The main body of that demonstration was around the, the local mosque in Tower Hamlets. So the Muslim community played a central part in that. Uh, imams, councillors, you know, the mayor, the mayor of Tower Hamlets, you know, all, all these people mm. came out. But the, the, the role of Muslim people in coming out on these demonstrations is absolutely central, uniting with everyone else, because that shows the EDL that you know, communities do live yes. and work well together in multiculturalism. And we're, we're not opposed to each other. We're friends, we're workmates, we're families, we're brothers and sisters, we're all together. So it's important that the Muslim community and everyone in the community yeah. comes out against the EDL. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd just like to echo what Paul said there. I would be delighted if uh, members of the Muslim community, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, uh, came and joined us in our peaceful counter. This is the 2nd of March. It is on Saturday, the 2nd of March, and we'll be gathering and assembling at Piccadilly Gardens at 11am. Uh, uh, I'll be there along with many other people. And the more Muslims that we can have joining with us, the better, because if we can show significant numbers, we can then prevent uh, the EDL from claiming any kind of victory on the day. Um, the EDL as well, if people have any fears, the police will be making sure that, that people are protected from the EDL, they are very aware. Um, but also I think it would be a wonderful opportunity to show all the people of Manchester and Britain that mm. Manchester as a city um, values and loves its Muslim community for the immeasurable contributions that Muslims have made to the city of Manchester for, for decades and decades. And uh, the more Muslims can come and join us in peace and harmony and joy on Saturday, uh, the better it will be, I think, for the city of Manchester. Okay. The <coughs> Manchester March yeah. for uh, the EDL yeah. is on the same day. Yes. So how is it being coordinated? What's happening? I mean, you can't have two marches at the same time, yeah. and you can't have them in the same place. No. So what's happening? 
what's happening, Aftab, is we, as Daniel said, we're assembling a Piccadilly Gardens for 11 o'clock. And there we're going to have a multicultural celebration. We're going to have speeches. And then we are going to march from Piccadilly Gardens to Albert Square. Uh, we're going to be separate from the EDL. We're, we're, not, we're not going for a confrontation or a conflict with them. We're going to show them that, we're, that the EDL are not welcome. So that's, that's the aim of the day. Okay. And as I say, that has worked in other places. We want to repeat that because I think we have a chance to deal a blow politically to the EDL. Mm -hmm. Because if we outnumber them, that will be the victory because yes. we will humiliate them by outnumber them us. in peace. Absolutely, and peaceful protest. Yeah. Uh, in protest, but not uh, in any way to oppose them as the, on the streets, as it were, not in any way to confront them. That's right, yes, yes. a peaceful protest, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Daniel, uh, on the day, mm -hmm. there'll be hopefully families there, people there, etc. Mm -hmm. How do you cater for so many different kinds of people? What, what would you do? Um, when you have that many different people coming down, I think one of the important things that Unite Against Fascism will be organising is drawing on the skills and the variety of activities that we can uh, enjoy on Piccadilly Gardens. There's going to be a samba band playing on the day, for instance. Um, there's going to be an opportunity for people, if they want to volunteer, to steward and provide advice to people about where we're going and what we're doing. Um, but I think with a day like this when we're hoping to have so many diverse peoples coming together I think the opportunity to speak to each other and to listen and to find out and check in with each other on how our lives are going these yeah. are difficult economic times I'm a Labour Party politician and I'll never miss the opportunity to complain about the state of the economy and I think it'll be a chance for us to to talk about how we're all struggling through and making ends meet and uh, and, and how we can work together to make our lives richer on, on more than an economic level um, so um, I think with Piccadilly Gardens as well, it's a great location, mm. there's always something going on. There's near permanently music of one kind or another in Piccadilly Gardens. Mm. It's uh, a real pleasure uh, on a level just to walk through. I, yes. I walked through the gardens coming to the studio today and um, the, the, there were drummers playing so loud I thought there was a protest already on. Yes. Uh, but it turned out it was just the afternoon drummers who turn up uh, out of their own time and for no gain of their own to, to entertain shoppers and people going by. And that's something else I want to say, the EDL will try and intimidate Mancunians and put them off shopping and put them off having a cup of coffee on Albert Square yes. in front of Manchester Town Hall. Our group of people will want to walk up to shoppers and say hello and ask them how they're going on and make them feel welcome in their own city and make them feel like they, they still have ownership of, of this shared space. You yeah. know? And I think uh, what Unite Against Fascism will do is to remind Mancunians that that shared ownership of space is something that people on the right wing will seek to attack. They, yes. they I think it's important to uh, <coughs> add here that you don't have to be a member of the UAF that's you think it's fascinating to join this meeting. You're not a member of a group. Uh, families, people on their own, you know, accord yes. can come in. That's absolutely uh, right. Yeah. Well, can I just ask you in that case, uh, Paul? Have you made any kind of uh, inroads into communities? For instance, have you uh, put out leaflets? Have you contacted people in different communities so that they know this match is happening? Yes. Yes, we have. Um, there have been a number of meetings taking place in mosques in Manchester. There's uh, leaflets uh, been given out uh, at mosques. Um, the trade unions in Manchester have been very, very much involved, not only uh, in saying they'll come to the demonstration, but actually helping to build it themselves as well. Um, there's the student community. Um, as Daniel said, we've got a number of councillors supporting uh, the demonstration, and those councillors uh, represent many people behind them, yes. as, as do the trade unions. Of course they do. So there's been a lot of work mm. uh, done to build it. And, and the main thing is we just want as many people as possible in mm. Piccadilly Gardens at 11 o'clock on the 2nd of March. Mm. Daniel, you were at the university, Manchester University? I was, yes. Uh, to invite people or Indeed. to do what? Uh, I was down at Manchester Students' Union to uh, not only invite people to join us from the student community and beyond, but also to to speak about the importance of, of why we need to be there on the 2nd of March because um, I think history teaches us that when uh, fascists aren't opposed, they succeed, then they win the day and uh, mm. I think it was about saying to our student friends, you still have a voice. This is a, a, a generation that's often seen as being apathetic and, yes. and I would disagree. What I saw was a keen student body really eager to engage and to find out about what was going on and to see what they could do to, to, to stop the march of far-right politics uh, yeah. in this country. So, uh, and Manchester students have a long history 
of, of being radical, of being brave, and of being peaceful and fun, and uh, also very, very intelligent and, and far more aware than the right wing tends to be. So. I'm going to stop you there for a call. Hello, for, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Who's calling in from where? Your sound is very light. Can you please turn your TV volume down? We can't hear you. Please turn the volume on your TV down, please. Thank you. Now, hello, Assalamu alaikum. Who's calling in from where? Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. And uh, peace to you all, the panel as well. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting program. Uh, I've got something to say there. I think, you see, wherever these sort of things are happening, I think the media and the government is very responsible for it. Because if you see what's happening around the world at the moment, you know, wars, and uh, terrorism and all these things. And there are people who probably fall into it. I don't think any human being is a bad human being. They are all born, born to be the nice people. But I think somebody is driving them. And especially I think the government is responsible for it. Because, I mean, every time you switch on the television, you know, there are things what they it's coming out from, <laughs> from the people who are responsible. I think they should be held responsible because every time there is something what is happening in this country, we are the citizen of this country, we love this country, we'll fight for this country. But at the same time, you see, I think there is no justification when the, when the rulers are like that. What do you do? That's all I want to say. Thanks. Thank you very much for your call. Uh, Dan, Daniel, I'll ask you about this because you talk about the rulers of the country. Uh, you said before, my city council is helping uh, the UAF in a way to stop the EDL or to stop racism. Yeah. Where do we go with this? I think we, uh, as local political representatives and leaders, we have to realise our responsibility. And I think it's a, a responsibility that comes from the bottom up, from local councillors all the way to Parliament. Um, I know uh, Lucy Powell, the MP for Manchester Central, has condemned in, in very strong terms um, the EDL's message and their presence on the 2nd of March. But uh, the caller, um, thank you very much. Um, I was very interested to hear what you had to say. Um, this caller has made a point. We have a responsibility. And when the message is wrong, from leaders in the world, then only bad things can follow. And all human beings are born good. I don't believe in absolute good and absolute evil. I believe that we're born with a, a position, a switch, where we're good people and only the world can turn us bad. And when bad people are in a position of responsibility and they send out a message of, of evil, of disrespect to others, um, of disunity, then, then people will end up being fooled and following that. Um, so I think, for instance, my party, the Labour Party, has a never-ending responsibility to try and sow good in the world and sow peace and we haven't always succeeded at that either um, so we must learn from our mistakes and we must be honest enough to say that we must do better and we must keep on doing better and we must keep on engaging and supporting uh, groups like United Against Fascism, leaders of those organisations like Paul Jenkins um, and so far it's been a, a privilege, it's been a, a lot of fun as well to work with Paul and all his uh, supporters and comrades who have I think really welcomed uh, the local Labour Party saying, actually, yeah, you're really welcome to come in and, and counter, uh, counter protest with us and find a way forward and, and explore ways of working with the leadership of Manchester so we have a peaceful future for all our people, especially our, our Muslim brothers and sisters. One thing, Paul, which I'm going to ask you, people yeah. would be very uh, interested in knowing is about is the involvement of the police. Uh -huh. Yeah. How are the police... Uh, dealing with the situation? Sure. Um, well, we have liaised with the police, uh, informed them that we will be holding a march and uh, a rally and a multicultural celebration. And we've had meetings with the police. So we've liaised with the police really at all times, if you like, about, about what we're doing. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, so as I say, we'll be assembling Piccadilly Gardens and marching to Albert Square. The police are fully uh, aware of what we're doing, um, so yeah. My concern is that we're going to have families there, uh -huh. little children hopefully, and mothers and fathers, etc. Yeah, yeah. Will there be enough police there to keep these two factions completely apart, or are there different timings of what's happening? Well, I think, 
I think it's important to say that, again, the question of numbers on our demonstration is key. That's how we beat fascism. You know, that's, you know, as I say, we're not going there for a fight or anything stupid like that. The key thing is our weapon is outnumbering yes. the EDL. I and think, I, I think the, the main weapon has got to be the ordinary person. Absolutely. You know, well, a person who cares about themselves, about their community, <laughs> about their family. Absolutely. And by coming out, they're actually saying, hey, this is my family, and I'm going to protect them in the best way possible, which is democratically. Yeah. I'm going to come out and make myself visible. That's right, absolutely. And, and if we think of places like Tower Hamlets yes. and Waltham Store, there were young, very young kids there. Yes. There were also pensioners there. That's the spirit we want. We yes. want it because we are the many and they are the few. You know, yes. so that is how we beat these people. You just raised, as you said, something very interesting there. Dan, uh, come in on this as well, please. Yeah. At the moment, the EDL are not a huge group. Maybe they might number in what hundred thousand. Probably less than that, even the nationwide. Probably less than that, much less than that. Yeah. If the Muslim community, especially, does not stand up for itself, yeah. I'm using the word "stand up" very loosely. I'm not yeah. saying in any way advocating violence yeah, or yeah. you know uh, a counter group, etc. If the Muslim community does not come forward, is there a likelihood that this group will gain more kudos, more power? Yes. More strength? Yes, there is, because as I said before. People stayed away in Luton in 2009 or Stoke in 2010 and the EDL were able to go and attack the communities. When people have come out in big numbers and opposed them, that's when the EDL have been stopped. And if we look again uh, at the defeats the EDL had in places like Walthamstow and Tower Hamlets, that was because people came out onto the streets. Right. And that, that, that affected the EDL's numbers. Now, if they're not opposed, these groups will grow. Racist and fascist organisations always start off small yeah. and they grow if they're not opposed. Absolutely. We can stop these people if we come out en masse and oppose them. Daniel, when you're, because uh, as you said before, you're a counsellor for a very inclusive Indeed. area of Manchester. Indeed. When something like this happens, how do you reassure people that you know, things are under control because yeah. I remember Manchester a few years ago. Well, mm -hmm. last year, wasn't it, when the EDL came to Manchester last year? Mm -hmm. It was last year. They I first think. came in 2009. Nine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then they came last year as well, I think. Was it 2011? Sorry, 2011. Mm -hmm. talking, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, 2011, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, at that time, the hoardings they had, the billboards they had, were so offensive. Yeah. And we managed to keep them at bay till now. Uh -huh. Now, how come they're coming back in Manchester now, Daniel? Um, I think uh, the EDL, like any group, uh, will find a vacuum and try to move into it. And in years gone by, I think they've had a sense of being able to walk into a political vacuum and a literal physical vacuum. Uh, I think this time around the city will have learned some lessons. And uh, I get the sense that the police have, have learned from previous experience of managing the EDL's arrival in, in both Manchester and in other towns and cities uh, uh, in Britain. And... Um, uh, for instance, on this occasion, um, the EDL are going to be corralled in one area and then moved uh, under police guard to another area, whereas ourselves will be in another part of the city, um, and that very nicely creates a distance between but the EDL who would... Also, you use the word corral, so in other words, yeah. they will be mm -hmm. uh, completely orchestrated in the way they are moved from one place yes, to another. Yes, absolutely. But the march for the mm -hmm. UAF yeah. would be a loosely guarded thing as it were people can be free to walk, yes. walk around people can come yeah. and go as they please yeah, yeah. Absolutely. they won't be corralled in any way no no absolutely and that's very important because I mean, that's what you discuss with the police and that's that's yeah. been accepted by the yeah. police yeah yes right. yeah. i would i would add to that and say that i think uh, the edl will be policed so they remain in a space whereas uh, unite against fascism and our counter demonstration will be policed in a way that should we need any protection which i think is highly unlikely but in in the unlikely event that we need any protection the police will be there to protect us yes. whereas i think where on the edl side they'll be protecting the people of manchester from the edl yeah. so but also i mean the the point i'm trying to make is that it'll be a very where the police are concerned with the uaf march mm. they'll be part of the march they'll be with the community 
so people can come and go, they can join the march, they can leave the march, they can walk around, they won't be sort of herded into... Well, uh, you know, our, our, our march will be yes. very much have a carnival atmosphere. Yes, that's, that's the point. As, as Daniel yes. said, we've got a samba it's band a celebration. There. It's a celebration yes. of yes. our multicultural yes. community. Yes. And we want people to... We want our march, if you like, to represent the freedom yes. and everything that's positive about our multicultural community. That's exactly community. what I'm trying to Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And our march will be very well stewarded yes. by our own people, uh, you know, which again will involve uh, members of the Muslim community, members of trade unions and so on. So yeah, it'll be, we, we want it to be a positive experience. And also we want to leaflet the general public as our march goes. So yes. we'll be giving out leaflets to people watching our march. Yeah. So it'll be a very loose and, and free and easy yeah. march, if you like. And it'll be, uh, <coughs> it'll be a great opportunity for us to, uh, as I said earlier, to meet our fellow Mancunians yeah. and, uh, and tell them what we're about and, and tell them why we're there. Because I, I think sometimes you see a march going by and you think, what are these people doing here? Yeah. You know, why are they blocking the traffic? Why can I not get my bus? And we'll have the opportunity yeah. to say, well, we're sorry for delaying yeah. the bus for five minutes, but here's why we're here, because Absolutely. we're really worried yeah. that these people, if we don't stand up to them with peace, uh, that if we don't stand up to them, then um, they're going to take your city, and uh, you know. The Which is the right. point you made before, Paul, about c Muslims hiding behind curtains. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, let's. Uh, your, your question before after about mm. why why are the EDL coming to Manchester? I think there's a couple of things to that really. First. I think they view Manchester in the same way that they viewed places like Blackburn and Preston. They, they because they see it as having a large Muslim community. That's why they want to bring these demonstrations here, and that's why the Muslim community must not do what the EDL have said and hide behind the curtains. But it's very important that all of us come out and, and protest yes. uh, against them. Also, I think it's important to say, I mentioned before that. The BMP leader Nick Griffin is the Northwest member of the European Parliament, yes. so that that obviously includes the Manchester area. Yeah. Griffin is making stronger connections with the EDL. It's only fifteen months to the election. I don't think it's a complete coincidence that the EDL are coming to the Northwest and coming to Manchester mm -hmm. in the run up to those elections as well. Absolutely. The first time now when, when uh, Nick Griffin became the MEP. Yeah. I believe it was due to apathy on the part of the people, they didn't go out to vote. Yeah. If, with the, say, involvement of the UAF and other organisations, people are made aware of what the uh, EDL and BNP stand for, mm. and what would happen to the society in the UK if they gained more MEPs or more power, Yes. do you think people would come out and actually stop them? Yes, I think so. I think that awareness is very important. Um, it's both the EDL and BMP try to pretend they're not racist and that there's something else. When we say EDL are against Muslims, BMP are against Muslims, they're against all black and Asian people, they're against trade unionists, and the only way by beating them is people to, for people to come out against yes. them. Mm -hmm. It's about getting that message across whether that's urging people to vote against mm. Nick Griffin next yeah. year or coming to Piccadilly Gardens on the 2nd of March. Um, it is raising that awareness. So, yes. Daniel, this is where I think you come in, mm -hmm. that it's going to be a political Indeed. and social, uh, you can say, structure come together yeah. if we want the um, MEP, yeah. Nick Griffin, out. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think the 2nd of March represents a, a really good opportunity to bring uh, the political and the social together because that's what the EDL are very cleverly mm. trying to do as well. They're trying to highlight um, tough times for people and they're, they're trying a very old trick, a very old political trick, which is to pick out one section of the community and say, look guys, it's not our fault, it's their fault. You know, It's not your fault, it's the Muslims' fault. If they weren't yeah. here, we'd have the jobs. Yeah. yeah. If they weren't exactly. here, we'd have the houses. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. they weren't here, we'd have the cars. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. But what they yeah. forget is you that these people work for. Yeah. If you yes. don't have a job. Well, if that Muslim wasn't there, you'd have his job. Yeah. What, what a deceptively simple argument that is. Yes. You know what? What that argument fails to take into account is the millions and millions of pounds that Muslim taxpayers pay into the British economy, the thousands and thousands of jobs that Muslim businessmen and women create, for not only for their fellow Muslims but but for other members of the community. Yes. You look at any modern complex business and the, the supply chains and the people they employ directly and indirectly. Every time a Muslim businessman sets up his business and employs four or five people, there's then 20 other people who become co-dependent on that employment economically. And, 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 and when Muslim businesses set up in Britain 
and succeed, they, they succeed for the entire community, for all of society. But the EDL will say, no, no, he's just taking your job. It's a lie. It's a very simple lie, and that's why it can seem like the truth when people are desperate. And they will use that message to try and support people like Nick Griffin, who so sadly succeeded in 2009 at a time when people were apathetic and mm. tired and were looking for a different message, I think, for, on a lot of issues. And, and when you get the, the vacuum of apathy, people like Nick Griffin step in. And what we've got to do on the 2nd of March is set the stage and say, look, today, go away, EDL. You're not welcome in Manchester. And tomorrow, and the day after, and for the next 15 months, we're getting ready to say, Nick Griffin, you've had your time. It's over. It's done. The people of Manchester deserve better. And the people of Britain deserve better than to be sending a representative into the European Parliament who is a racist, who is a fascist, and he dresses himself up uh, a million different ways to try and deny that. But the truth always comes out with Nick Griffin. He is a fascist and a racist. And if given half a chance, he will attack you because you're Muslim, because you're a trade unionist, because you're a socialist, because you're not a racist, because you're a kind human being who cares about other people. They're the kind of people that Nick Griffin wants to attack. Mm. Absolutely. And Griffin, the BNP leader Nick Griffin, he actually said, he described Islam as a, a vile, sick religion. A vile, sick creed. <laughs> creed, that's what Yes, that's what this is. man hates Muslims yes. and he's representing the northwest of, yeah. of England yeah. in the European yeah. Parliament. Yeah. You, Unite Against Fascism with the support of people like Daniel have launched their Nick Griffin Must Go campaign to yeah. kick him out. Yeah next year uh, and it's, it's very important that we do that as Daniel yeah. says we've, we've got to oppose mm -hmm. the fascists on the streets and at the so ballot this box. time round when the elections come around in 15 months time yeah. the people have got to show their will through the ballot box yes. Yes. which they didn't do last time yeah. and if they do that yeah. then we might be able to get rid of Nick Griffin mm -hmm. and people might be able to uh, well people know that it's their vote that's done it Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. And that's very important that people have got the choice of having the BNP in power yes. as an MEP or take them out of power. That's right. And these marches, these walks that you do, etc., are leading towards that to make, mm -hmm. create an awareness for people. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Sorry. What will make a difference to the fortunes of the EDL? And I actually think a lot hinges on the future of the EDL in this demonstration. They are putting a lot of work mm -hmm. into this. If we outnumber them, if we humiliate them, it will be a real blow to the EDL. Mm. Then if we follow up, as Daniel said, 2nd March, with kicking Nick Griffin out in 2014, that will be a blow for the whole far right in Britain. Yes. But more than that, it will actually serve as a beacon of inspiration to people in other parts of Europe, yeah. where you see the advance of fascist organisations mm in places like France, where you have the French National Front attacking Muslim people, yeah. in places like Greece with Golden Dawn attacking uh, the traveller community. You know, the, 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 the advance of fascist groups there is really scary, yeah. particularly in the heat of the crisis. So yeah. we've got to stop the fascists here and provide a, an inspiring yeah. message to people in the rest yeah. of Europe. And, and just to add to that, <coughs> If you want to think about this personally, think mm. about the personal benefits of protecting this country from uh, this, this, this fascist uh, message that the EDL are propagating. Um, I can't th help but think of the personal benefit. I, I wouldn't be who I am today if I hadn't have grown up in a multicultural community. I was mm. born and raised in Bolton. And uh, I'm thinking today, I've got one, one, one friend in particular who's my oldest friend, he's Muhammad Ali, I believe he's watching today in Singapore, <laughs> so hello. Um, and I can't, I can't imagine I'd be the person that I am today without the input of his friendship, without his support and his family. He, his father uh, is an imam. Um, and, and taught me a great deal, you know, and his mother too. And I used to go to school with that guy. And um, when he comes to England, we still meet up today. Um, I don't want to live in a world, I don't want to live in a country or a city where I, 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 I can't call Muhammad Ali my oldest friend. And these people, the EDL, these people want to create a country where, I don't, where people like me when we're children and where your children and my children don't get to go to school with somebody who could be their friend for life purely because their skin colour is wrong in their eyes and their religion is, is not the right religion for Britain. There's no such thing as the right religion for Britain. All religion is the right religion for Britain. All faith is British faith. All global faith is British faith. Whenever 
and wherever it appears. Faith is a universal thing and it, it should be respected for all at all times. And what the EDL say is, well, we don't want that. Well, it's a very, very simplistic, a very, very stupid way to look at things. The benefits that I have experienced of having Muslim and Hindu and Jewish friends are uh, absolutely priceless. I don't want to live in a world, I don't want to live in a society where I don't have the benefit of friendship with people who share my skin colour. It's mm. ridiculous yeah. in the extreme. So if you're wondering, well, should I, shouldn't I go down on the 2nd of March? I'd say come down because you're protecting some of the most valuable parts of your own life by doing so. Yeah. I've got a call on the line. Let's get that first. Mm -hmm. Hello, Salam Alaikum. Who's calling in from where? Hello? Oh, hello, yes. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, I've been listening to your conversation, particularly the views from the two gentlemen <coughs> who is talking about this uh, racist uh, demonstration yes. tomorrow and so and so. One thing I'm trying to understand <coughs> that while we all appreciate and understand that it is in all our interest, in the interest of the community, of British community, that we all live together, it doesn't matter what color, religion, or race we belong to, because we have to live as one entity. Now, when such people, a small minority, who comes up and uh, and they claim that oh they have freedom now freedom of what surely such a freedom violate the human rights to live in harmony and peace if such people come up and start talking about this uh, about the religious belief of people about their background to go and so and so what kind of minds they have to create uh, a sort of disharmony in the community, opposing each other, standing in front of each other, you know, just like perhaps uh, uh, two opposed factions who don't understand each other as such. I mean, we call ourselves here, we're living in a civilized world. There is a legitimacy for people who have come from abroad, who have come, who have made their homes here. They're nearly third and fourth generations have grown up here, and they regard this country as equally as you regard your this country. So I can't understand that why these such a small minority who always have slogan of freedom of expression, freedom of this and freedom of that, do they realize that by their action, how much effect they have to destroy that kind of good relationship within which the community should survive and thrive? Uh, and, and why can't we uh, express our opinion to our local MPs to do something about this, to somehow legislate such expressions, you know, to destroy the community. Why can't we, at international level or through the United Nations, promote a human relationship which is based upon friendship, understanding, love, and affection? And as far as the Islam religion is concerned, these people should realize that Islam is a religion of peace and love. Islam has nothing to do with those aspects of political uh, situation which the world has created themselves, you know, in which Islam is blamed for any, anything. There's nothing to do with Islam. It's the, it's the people who fight for their own interests in the name of Islam. Islam certainly doesn't tell any Muslims to go and kill or to do this wrong or to do that wrong. It is totally against the principles of Islam. So I think these messages should be conveyed to these people and they should try to understand more about Islam in a simplistic way they can and we should bring a good relationship with them if we can. If we can't, obviously, then we can't live. This is certainly a violation of human rights to live together. Paula, thank, thank you. you very much for your call. Thank you. One thing you just said, which I must uh, well, I like to address myself, is that you just said that why can't we approach our MPs? There's nothing to stop you. If enough people within the community spoke to their MPs, lobbied their MPs, laws would change. It's because we're not doing it that they're not changing. It's because we're not doing it that these people are gaining strength. Am I right in saying that, Daniel, in a simplistic way? I couldn't agree more. And <coughs> it's the year 2013, and you'll find all five of your Manchester MPs have not only a traditional office where you can write a letter, and I would strongly encourage letter writing. It's great when they drop through the post box. Um, but you can go on Twitter. You can yes. go on Facebook. Um, you can use uh, you can use LinkedIn if you like. You can even phone. Million things. Really? Yeah, goodness, you really? can use a phone as yes, well. Yes. But um, I, I want to touch on a couple of the points that, yes. that our latest caller made. And number one, yeah, you're right. Islam is a religion of peace and love. 
Um, in, in every walk of life, there are the vast majority of people who are decent and kind and peaceful. Unfortunately, in any large movement, there are a minority of people who seek to misrepresent what, re what a religion or a faith or a society is all about. Uh, we've seen this throughout history um, in Russia, in Germany, in Ireland, there have been minorities committed to violent solutions to what should be problems that can yes. be solved peaceably. Um, and also, uh, unfortunately, Islam has been targeted by ex a, a tiny minority of extremists who have given Islam a, a bad name on occasion. Um, but I, I think it's incumbent upon people, as the, as the caller says, to use your freedom of speech. Write to your MP, come out onto the street and talk to people. I hope that when Muslims do turn yes. up, that if fellow Mancunians who have heard mixed messages about Islam are curious, then they can come up and talk to Muslims. Ask Muslims, what is your faith about? You know, Ask them about, uh, and tell, it'll be an opportunity for Muslims to talk about the pillars of faith, to talk about peace and love, and the importance of charitable giving within the religion of Islam. You know, th th There are all these opportunities, but what I must say, and this is where the EDL really offend me, they claim that freedom of speech is the reason why they can come to our towns and our cities and do damage and attack people. And when, when we say we don't want that, they say, oh, well, freedom of speech. Well, I say freedom of speech is conditional on respecting the people you're speaking to. Exactly. Yes, yes with rights, a very mm. simple, old-fashioned message. Mm. With rights come responsibilities. You can say whatever you want in this country, but not if you're hating people. Not yes. if you're telling people, go and attack your neighbour. You know, that's that, that's not freedom of speech. That's incitement to hatred. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. it's morally indefensible. Yeah. I mean, everyone knows of Stephen Lawrence, the yes. young black teenager who was murdered. Yeah. What maybe not everyone does know is that Stephen was one of a number of young black or Asian men who was murdered in 1993 or thereabouts in the area that was in the vicinity of the BMP's headquarters in that part of London. Mm. That's no mistake. Mm. So when fascist and racist groups like BMP and EDL become politically active, there is a body count to this. Racist attacks increase wherever the BMP have won council seats. And I always argue that you know fascist groups have always used democracy and free speech in order to smash democracy and free speech. Why for is it Paul else. that when a Muslim, yeah. and this is very apparent for the cartoon with Netanyahu yeah. about four weeks or three weeks ago, I actually did a program on this as okay. well. When there's a cartoon about Netanyahu, even Rupert Murdoch apologizes, yeah. and is considered, you know, uh, emotionally disturbing for uh, the Jewish community. Okay. But when and but when there's blasphemy against the Holy Prophet of Islam, yes. <coughs> then it's free speech. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, I think that goes back to uh, a point that Daniel and one of the callers uh, made before, that um, you know, there's a degree of res uh, respectability in the establishment, if mm. you like, for racism against Muslims, mm. for Islamophobia. And I think much of the media, much of the press uh, is responsible for that. Uh, racism, racist organisations and fascist organisations they always have targets, but the targets change. Mm. You're um, right, in the 30s it was the Jews, now, now it's the Muslims. Mm. And I think we were talking before, um, I don't know if people know that the person who actually received the conviction for holding the biggest collection of terrorist explosives in Britain was not a Muslim, but was a man called Robert Cottage, who was a BNP member, a BNP candidate. This man was white, he was not Muslim, it, you didn't hear about it on the front pages of the Sun Absolutely. and the tabloids yes. in this paper mm. uh, in this country because Robert Cottage of the BMP did not fit the stereotypical image of what the right wing and the far right say a terrorist is. You know, I'm going to have to stop you there because we're running out of time. <laughs> Daniel, a message from you or a few last words from you yeah. about either the second of March or whatever you feel. I'd start by saying the only thing required for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And next week it's Manchester's turn to stand up. If we don't stand up, if we stop at home, if we hide behind the curtains like they want us to do, they will feel their power grow. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to all the people around us to come out next Saturday and to say in peace, in joy, but with determination, that Manchester is a beautiful, multi-ethnic, multi-religious city that we are all really proud to play a part in building and constantly growing. 
So come down on the 2nd of March and join us. That is the way we beat the EDL. We don't beat them with fists and violence. We beat them with joy and music and love and respect. Absolutely. Paul. Come to Piccadilly Gardens on the 2nd of March at 11 o'clock. That's mm. the key message to get across. We have a chance to really inflict a big defeat on the EDL and to, as I said, follow that up, d d defeat Nick Griffin next year as well. So everyone needs to come to the demonstration on the 2nd of March. Bring your family and friends. We want to stand up, not hide behind the curtains, yes. as you say. Absolutely. Absolutely, because that's what the EDL want. If we, if we do that, the EDL have won and they, they have managed to target the Muslim community and all our multiracial community. We can't let them do that. It's really important all of us come out together, you know, Muslim, Christian, black, white, Asian, young and old, everyone all together, Piccadilly Gardens, 11 o'clock, 2nd of March, say no to the EDL. Daniel Gillard, Councillor for Manchester City, Can uh, Manchester City, thank you very much for being here today thank you. and thank you for your views. Paul Jenkins. Uh, uh, North West Organiser for UAF, thank you for being here. Thank you. Enough. And thank you for telling us about the march. And hopefully your message, both of your messages, gone out to the people yeah. and they will be there yeah. on that day. Thanks. In conclusion, I think it's fair to say that this is one time when the Muslim community should stand up for itself. This is one time when the Muslim people with families should be out in the centre of Manchester. Because by coming out to Piccadilly Gardens on the 2nd of March at 11 o'clock in the morning, you will make a statement that will be seen all around the world. If you believe that other people should act on your behalf, if you believe that other people should stand up for you, then all I can say is the Muslim community deserves what it gets, which is second-class press, second-class uh, exposure to anything good within their community. The reason why, one of the main reasons why the Muslim community is perceived to be the way it is, is because we are not re uh, interacting. We're not coming out. We're not joining groups like the UAF, Manchester City Council who are working to help eradicate racism. Other groups like that. This one, BNP, you would, EDF, sorry, EDL and everybody else who is from the far right wing takes power. Because of our apathy, because of our quietness, they believe us to be either weak or frightened. You've heard the phrase, hiding behind the curtains three or four times in the program today. It's very apt because that's what they want. It's our chance to show them we are not frightened, we are not militant, we are not aggressive, but we do know our rights. We can stand up for ourselves. We are British, we are part of this community, and we're going to show that Britain is better off with us than without us. And hopefully, once we do that, Britain will be a better place because Muslims will have a more recognised part in the society. Their place in society that they have today, people are more aware of. And that's the other thing that we haven't done. Because, as Daniel said earlier on, our businesses, our expertise, our professionalism is kept within our community. It's not highlighted. It's not hallelujah. People don't know the contribution that Muslims make to the British community. On the 2nd of March is one of your chances to show that. So I hope you'll be there then. And hopefully the EDL will also see that the Muslims are here to stay. This is Aftar Bermud with Flashpoint. Until next week, same